Let's talk about some relationships in the periodic table, which falls into module 8.2. Okay, and so some of this we've seen a little bit earlier. Okay, this kind of falls into the category of periodic trends. These are patterns that emerge in the periodic table when we're looking at different chemical and physical properties when the elements are arranged in the periodic table. And so usually we can describe these periodic trends in terms of a relatively small number of variables. Okay, and so these are things like the number of valence electrons, number of core electrons, and number of protons, also known as the effective nuclear charge. So let me show you some specific examples of different periodic trends that you might come across. Okay, first let's talk about atomic radius. So atomic radius generally decreases across a period and generally increases down a group. You can see the trend here. Okay, as I go left to right, these atoms tend to get smaller, and as I go top to bottom within the same group, they get bigger. But as we saw earlier, this trend only seems to work for main group elements, okay? Things that are in the A block, right? The alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, and all the things that are kind of on the right-hand side, okay? But not necessarily the transition metals. That doesn't work so well for the B part of the periodic table. Here's another um, periodic trend, ionization energy, okay? What happens as you go down and as you go across? Well, generally speaking, as you go down a group, the ionization energy tends to decrease, which also makes sense because ionization energy is the energy you need to lose or take away an electron. So as you go further and further away, it becomes easier and easier to lose these electrons, right? The nucleus doesn't have such a strong hold on the electrons that are further out. So as the atoms get bigger, it becomes easier for them to ionize. Whereas if you go left to right across the periodic table, the ionization energy tends to increase. It becomes harder for them to lose electrons because they'd rather actually gain electrons to have a stable outer shell as far as their electron configurations go. Okay? But there are some minor effects that we talked about earlier in the course, like which subshell they're in, or if you have paired or unpaired electrons. Okay? But generally speaking, the trends still hold. So just as an example, Let's look at some periodic trends in group 13, which is the boron family of the periodic table. Okay, and so boron happens to be a nonmetal slash metalloid. Okay, it's a little bit hard to describe. It does form covalent bonds the way that you would expect nonmetals to, but it also has some properties in common with things like semiconductors. Okay, and because of uh, a diagonal relationship with silicon, that tends to happen. Okay, and so it is in some cases behaving like a metalloid, but in some cases behaves more like a nonmetal. Aluminum, however, which is right below boron, is more of a metal slash metalloid. Okay, it can form covalent bonds, but it can also lose electrons to form ions the way that you would expect metals to do, in, in which case they are Al3 plus ions. Gallium, which is underneath aluminum, also forms plus three ions, and this is more of a metal, and the reason that it tends to form ions with a charge of positive three is because that way you can have a stable electron configuration in the outermost energy level. Okay, the electron configuration would be that of argon and then 3D10. So it has a filled 3D valence shell. If you go underneath gallium to indium and thallium, these tend to form plus one ions because they only lose one valence electron in the P shell, but not the ones in the S. Those are considered inert or unreactive. So now, a second ago, I mentioned something called a diagonal relationship. Okay, what the heck is that? Well, we talked a little bit about periodic trends and what happens as you go across or down, but not really as you go diagonally. Okay, and so it turns out that there are certain properties in common when you go diagonally that are a little bit different than the ones as you go up or down or left or right. Okay, so often the first member of a group has properties that are different from other members of the group but they're still similar to those of the second member of the adjacent group. That's a mouthful, okay? That sounds like a lot. But I think you can see it a little bit more clearly if you look at this version of the periodic table. Okay, in other words, if you go diagonally, lithium is diagonal to magnesium. These have similar properties to each other. 
as do beryllium and aluminum or boron and silicon. And the reason for this is because they tend to have similar charge densities. Okay, so just as an example, let's look at lithium. Okay, lithium can form carbonates, fluorides, hydroxides, and phosphate salts that are much less soluble than all of the corresponding salts of these other alkali metals. In other words, if you go back to the things like solubility rules, things like sodium carbonate or sodium fluoride or sodium hydroxide or sodium phosphate, these should all be soluble in water, and they are. But if you look at the lithium versions of these things, they're really not that soluble at all. Okay? And so it turns out that the reason for that is because it behaves more like magnesium. Okay? Similarly, magnesium carbonate, uh, excuse me, lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide can combine to form lithium oxide, just like magnesium carbonates and magnesium hydroxides can also form magnesium oxides. Okay, also, lithium can react with nitrogen to make lithium nitride, whereas other alkali metals don't react with nitrogen to do that. Lithium can also combine with oxygen to make lithium oxide, whereas other alkali metals tend to react more violently with oxygen and form things like peroxides or superoxides. And so in this sense, again, it behaves more like the alkaline earth metals than the alkali metals themselves.